Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us to, uh, for this uh, webinar on uh, legged robotics with a focus on uh, industrial applications in particular. Uh, it's hosted by the Orca Hub. Um, uh, it's an industry strategy challenge funded hub uh, focusing on the inspection and certification of offshore um, assets, aerial, um, terrestrial and, and subsea. And it's also hosted in conjunction with uh, UK RAS. It's a representative organization for robotics with, uh, in, in the academic sector as part of their uh, summer showcase for, uh, for 2021. Um, Anna, can you move on to the, the, the second slide? Uh, so we have a, a pretty uh, packed schedule that, are, uh, that will overview the industrial use cases in, in a couple of different sectors. Uh, and then uh, a couple of academic presentations followed by um, uh, some live demos of both the Animal and the Spot um, uh, quadruped robots, and we'll finish up with a, with a Q&A. So to try to stay on schedule, I'll uh, switch over to uh, Will Newsom, who's head of um, nuclear engineering at Createc. Uh, Will, can you hear me? Yes, I can do. Yes, thank you very much, Maris. Sure. Uh, feel free to, to go ahead. Right, can you see the screen? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, right. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. So I'm Will Newsom. I'm Head of Nuclear Engineering for Greatech. And as Maurice said, I'm going to be talking about the uh, use cases for legged robots in nuclear and oil and gas. So we'll start off with uh, saying that the main drivers of the two industries could be summarised by the Nuclear Decommission Authority and the uh, Oil and Gas Authority, their grand challenges and the uh, technical priorities. So the NDA have set out their grand challenges and these are to reduce waste by increasing recycling, to uh, provide intelligent infrastructure by using autonomous technology to manage assets and buildings, uh, to move humans away from harm through the autonomous systems and robotics. And finally, by uh, adopting digital approaches for uh, capturing and for using data. In a similar fashion, the oil and gas <clears throat> technical authority, the oil and gas authority uh, with their technical priorities um, have the uh, well cost reduction. So that's reducing the cost of the first drilling and construction of the wells. The small pools, that's um, unlocking development of marginal continental shelf uh, discoveries by reducing costs through leverage of technology. Asset integrity, so it's gaining those efficiencies in the integrity and the inspection um, and reduction of maintenance costs through, through technology. Uh, digital technology is deploying these advanced methods to acquire, to share, to analyze, and to use data for diagnostics and decision making. And then finally, in decommissioning, it's the aim is to drive um, efficiencies through, through use of technology in plugging of the wells, the site abandonment, and the final safe decommissioning of the facility. And so with all of these, with all of these different, different drivers, it's conceivable that, that legged robots will play a vital role in the delivery of, of these priorities. So all of those headline drivers from the NDA and from the Oil and Gas Authority, um, uh, we can see that, that, that the challenges and priorities can drive these, these following um, uh, five uh, use case areas. So start off with operation support. In, in operation support, legged robots could be used for collection of data from operational plant which isn't connected to any kind of data system. So the legged robot could traverse around the difficult industrial environment and it can uh, read dials and look at the position of manual valves and in some cases actuate those manual valves as well. It can actually perform the site walk downs, which is typically a job performed by, by humans traversing over that difficult terrain. With inspection, um, the condition monitoring and the periodic inspection can be autonomously delivered by the legged robots. Importantly, uh, this removing the operator from those potentially hazardous areas. 
Of course, there's the additional benefit that um, data collection uh, by this method will be in its nature metric, uh, as opposed to the subjective human-led assessment. In decommissioning, the main use cases here are the initial area um, assay and survey to determine um, the safety condition, what, what the actual condition of the plant area is. And secondly, in potentially removing those hazards present in that area by the legged robot, deploying a recovery or a, or a manipulation payload. In emergency support, the legged robot is, is ideal in that it provides this highly adaptable platform which can traverse many different environments to deliver um, additional data for emergency responders. It can effectively become the eyes and ears of those first responders. And finally, in supporting of safety case, the robot could conceivably become part of the actual safety measures in delivering those safety case requirements. For example, in the case of, um, there might be a facility where a HVAC failure um, means that auto means that auto automatically a set of valves must close and the area will be filled with an inert gas. In that type of situation, the legged robot could be deployed um, to deliver the capability to remotely confirm that those valves have actually been closed and the area has in fact been filled with gas. And again, this removes the operator from, from the harm of confirming that uh, site condition. So in each of these applications, legged robots provide a credible platform which holds certain advantages over aerial vehicles and the uh, wheeled vehicle counterparts. So plant areas are generally designed for us bipedal humans. Um, accessing these areas by wheel robots can be quite challenging. Usually um, we design wheel robots for one specific application or for one specific asset area. And that generally requires a significant amount of, of, of engineering design time and, and uh, uh, financial support. But unlike wheel robots, the legged robots can be highly adaptable to many differing environments. So we really need systems which, uh, which can carry out a large number of functions as opposed to developing one system for one specific purpose. It's important to say that legged robots are far more likely to be used as a whole organizational asset uh, and therefore they're able to deliver significant commercial advantages over other vehicle platforms. Continuing with the thought of legged robots as being these, <clears throat> excuse me, highly adaptable platforms, Createc and Oxford Robotics Institute have teamed together to deliver an Innovate UK funded project um, for oil and gas and nuclear industries. <clears throat> the, this project is the Auto Inspect project, and it's, it's an innovative and adaptable set of modules which deliver an, 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 an agnostic method of autonomously surveying assets in highly regulated industries, nuclear and oil and gas. So Auto Inspect Project is going to use the Boston Dynamics Spot to autonomously deliver the inspection payloads. And in this case, those payloads are 360 camera images, inspection camera images, thermal IR, optical gas sensing, and material identification through, through RAM. The system will spatially locate the inspection survey data in a 3D model of the environment, and the data will integrate with the customs existing BIM system or facility. This slide here is an example of the uh, spatial location of uh, survey information. So the operator is navigating around a, a 3D model. In this case, it's a Unity model. And what's happened is that somebody has wandered around a real facility with the device on the right, which is just quite simply a camera with a localization system. They've captured all that information. It's automatically been loaded into the point cloud and spatially registered with the 3D model. The operator now is looking at an area of, of interest, identified that area of interest in the model, selected um, what, what dates they want the images from, and then up pops the images that's associated 
uh, uh, with, with, with that model. This leads us into this leads us into, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a previous rail industry example where we take an immersive environment, taking the spatially located data, the 360 imagery, and we add in further asset information. It allows intuitive access to all operational and historic information, uh, and it can be used for engineering decision making. So ultimately, this system will become a platform from which surveys are planned by the operator then SPOT will be commanded to conduct those surveys in multiple environments and the data uploaded back into this system for viewing and storage. So it allow us to extract so much more value from the captured data and from that uh, inspection asset being SPOT. I'll just try to skip onto the next slide just to finish off with by saying that uh, Createc, we're really quite proud that we are channel partners with Boston Dynamics. So we work with Boston Dynamics to provide spot into the nuclear industry uh, of Europe and Japan. We are early adopters of the technology and we really strongly believe that, that legged robots can be developed to credible vehicles which aid construction, operation and decommissioning of nuclear and oil and gas assets. That's the end of my presentation. Um, are we moving to questions or are we moving onwards? Thank we're, you very we're much. Move on. oh, thanks, we're going to move onwards and um, have questions at the end. Um, but in particular, I find it interesting to know about the safety cases that can actually propel what is inherently a complicated technology into being required because it presents the opportunity to reduce risk. Um, yes. which, which, is, which is quite an interesting thing to pick up when you're focusing on algorithms and technology to, to see how it could actually be adapted. Um, we'll switch over to uh, Gabriel. Um, Gabriel, it's been a while. Um, it's good to see you again. Um, would you like to, to, to share your screen and, and, and run through your presentation? Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Brilliant, thank you. So morning everyone, my name is Gabriel Drojo. I work for Costain and um, I'll be presenting on some of the use cases of um, legged robots in the construction industry. So just a quick introduction to Costain. We're a smart infrastructure um, solutions provider. We're typically a tier one contractor. So we do your usual builds um, for sort of stations, um, airports and so on. We work with blue chip clients such as your HSTs, um, infrastructure owners like Network Rail, local authorities like the Lancashire Council and so on. Also water and energy utilities companies, so the likes of Thames Water, Southern Water, those are businesses um, we work with closely. Importantly, um, I work in the R&D innovation team and um, we've got a very close relationship with SMEs, so small medium enterprises, as well as universities and research institutes where we um, carried R&D funded projects with um, these organizations to deliver um, impact to our industries. In terms of our vision and what our clients are asking for, three main things around construction sites and the work we deliver. They want sustainability, so greener future, safety, no harm to people working on these projects, but also productivity, reduced costs, so delivering projects on time, um, automa automating and uh, digitizing processes and how we deliver our projects. Um, in terms of safety, we want to de-risk site activities and potentially eliminate hazards before they occur on sites. And um, with construction, we've got a lot of confined space working. So again, trying to automate that and taking the need for humans to go into hazardous environments. In terms of greener future, again, we're trying to eliminate waste. Um, reduce the amount of travel and the workforce needed on site, so less carbon emissions. Um, and again, sticking to the agenda set by the UK government, we want to be net zero on or before 2035. What's our vision? When we think of a construction site, we think of a connected and autonomous construction site. Here you've got machines working together collaboratively, sharing data in real time and being able to adjust to changing um, situations um, as soon as possible. 
Also, we think about digital twins. How can we simulate construction sites before we go on there to do any work? This will cut down a lot of costs in terms of planning and in terms of design. Digital twins can also support in terms of a control center where you can visualize what's going on on your, on, on your site in real time and being able to uh, make proactive um, interventions when necessary. So these two um, sort of earmark what Costain is looking to do um, in future in supporting the vision towards safety, productivity, and a, a greener um, construction industry. As a business, we believe legged robots play a massive part and we believe they can support um, that vision. In terms of use cases, high level, we can think of many around um, safety, site inspections, asset maintenance, but also the connected autonomous construction site piece I, I talked about. In the, middle of, in the middle of all of this is a remote control center where you can teleoperate uh, robots, legged robots such as the spot robot, the um, animal robot um, in real time from a remote location. Again, um, supporting the shift from what from working on site to working from any remote location. Under improved safety, working um, with uh, university partners, working with SMEs, we understand that the legged robots are very flexible and can integrate with various sort of payloads. And this is beneficial because you can integrate with AI, video analytics, and other forms of technologies to, to gain some of these benefits highlighted on here. So under safety, you can check if people on our construction sites have the right PPE on. You can um, look out for hazard detection, so have cones falling out of place, or people working past the restricted areas they should be um, working within. In terms of site inspections, can we automate how we inspect our infrastructure, our bridges, um, our viaducts, and so on? Uh, can we map out our sites in real time and have BIM models or link into photogrammetry and our BIM models to give us um, richer information of the site activities going on? In terms of asset maintenance, a lot of tunnels, a lot of confined space working. Can we send the spot robot down there to carry out repair works? Can we send it down there to do scans and surveys of the environment um, um, within these confined spaces? And lastly, the connected autonomous plan in future. Can the spot robot be used to control machinery? Can it be the remote presence on a site rather than having a site manager? Can the spot robot actually take charge and you know, um, control various plot machinery to work autonomously and communicate, receive data in real time from these sort of machinery? We've worked closely with a few of our client, um, clients and um, particularly we've highlighted a site that's very keen to start trialing and utilizing some of the um, led robots available out there. They've highlighted key things around inspections, maintenance, and surveying. In terms of maintenance, they've they've got an eight mile or nine mile um, stretch of um, roadworks to be done with various um, independent sites along the way. Can we use spot to do all of the security checks rather than sending humans um, on, on trucks um, sort of increasing carbon emission? Can we use spot to do all of the security checks and maintaining the whole um, works going on? In terms of inspection, all of the bridges being built and all of the survey works being, being um, carried out before any work is done. Can we use the spot robot again, or can we use any legged robot such, such as the animal robot to go in there and do all of those survey works and scan the environment before any construction actually is done. Um, the key things as well, hazard detection and being able to sort of reduce accidents and incidents on, on construction site is an important thing. Um, importantly, um, asset strikes are a common thing within the, common, within the construction industry. Can we use the spot robot to do some of the surveying and sort of the cable avoidance testing that's usually carried out before we break down ground and start excavating on, on our projects? So these are more specific to use of a highways um, client in terms of use cases for the construction industry. What are we doing about it? So we're currently working with the University of Edinburgh and Oxford on an EU project called uh, Memory of Motion. And um, we've done um, a site trial at uh, HS2 Houston site where we've deployed the robot to um, scan um, a building about to be demolished. So uh, the a section of the building had fallen over due to sort of strong winds. And rather than send humans into this dangerous hazardous environment, we decided to use the spot robots to carry out the the, the pre-survey scans before the builder was finally demolished. We've got a project with Highways England um, working towards their connected and autonomous plant vision, where again, we see these legged robots playing an important role. 
Um, again, you can see the transformation of how we work on our sites with the incorporation of technologies such as drones, um, such as autonomous plants. We've got some um, autonomous pavers nowadays. And can we use spot robots again or the animal robot to start controlling some of these uh, machinery or plant equipment on our sites? Um, the market for this con connected autonomous plant is over 200 billion pounds by 2040. And again, this is definitely an area we want to be working in. And I, I see Costain as a leader in ensuring we get that vision of connecting all of these great technologies um, and um, robotics and AI um, technologies together to, to create impact for the industry. Um, these are all my slides. And just to say, I'm very keen to collaborate and work together with sort of research partners and industry to ensure that um, we, we keep changing the way the construction industry is seen as very labor intensive to more automated and digitized processes of working. So thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Gabriel. Um, uh, Sen, would you like to pick up from here? Um, yeah, thanks, Maurice. So I will share my screen. Uh, yeah, so I need a way to get to the stop. Yeah, so I will share my just screen. Remind yeah. we'll, uh, just to remind attendees, we'll, we'll keep questions for the end. Um, some have some questions for Gabriel, to be honest. Can you see my screen here? Yes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So uh, my name is Sen Wang. I'm an associate professor at Health Water University. And um, I'm also the core investigator in the Oka Hub. So today's talk actually is what uh, introduced what we think the sport platform we have and the our ideas, how we're using that for the industrial innovation and also uh, present some of the preliminary results we had on one of the construction sites. So I'll uh, very quick introduce uh, some of the research areas in our uh, uh, group and also the national robot term we have a robotics and autonomous systems lab so one of the main areas we focus on is robot perception and the navigation is how to using cameras to look like in the robots with the different sensors and uh, navigating around autonomously and also one of the main areas we focus on is marine robotics uh, another very big area so we really heavily look at and is Robot learning, so how to use the data we collect from the robot. So helping the robot to have a better and safer autonomy, but meanwhile using this data to support other industrial processes. So going back to the topic, so about the sport robot, we got one of the sport robot about like one and a half months ago. And we think this is a very robust mobile platform with very strong transversability on the very, especially on some of these very challenging terrains, I think we are also mentioned before. But more important, we think, so this sport robot is really a mobile data center, which help us to facilitate all the data collection and analysis, eventually combining all these machine learning AI algorithms to support all the different kind of industry applications and solve the user cases. So using this robot, and I think especially uh, to move it to move around different terrains with the traditional wheel robot couldn't do. I think this is eventually a really big benefit. So look at the robot itself. So this is the robot's platform current R1. So we are still doing ongoing uh, development, but currently we have a 360 uh, omnidirectional directional camera to have all the images around for the inspection. And also we have a 360 uh, LiDAR is 16 channel and also with the uh, onboard computer wireless connection. So we are also planning to install other sensors like a microphone, thermal cameras, depends on the industrial user cases, we're gonna have other sensors. So in terms of the software side, so we have a 3D mapping navigation algorithms to also uh, come with the autonomous capability from the spot. And more importantly, actually, so is we developing all the suits to support this mobile data center, enable for this 24 seven data collection, a live and a remote operation monitoring from anywhere around the world, and some kind of telepresence to do the inspection, understand the process, and also some algorithms embed on board or on the cloud deployed to process all the data collected. So just in case some of you are not really uh, familiar with the sport robot, it has the onboard five cameras, depth cameras. So this colored 
point cloud you can see here that's from the onboard camera so this white points is what we get from our 360 lidar so using all this we can have a 360 perception to help in the robot to understand the terrain and also avoid obstacles so we are also using the point cloud to build the map i'm going to show a case later so in terms of the control of the sport so there's different ways uh, we can using the controller coming from the robots and very intuitively control it. So one of the very interesting and useful control of the sport and all these leg robots anymore. So is controlling is pose, body pose. So that means sometimes you can get in much more uh, kind of useful data from different kind angles and perspectives. And for the lidar scanning, sometimes it's also very helpful to scan much, much denser point cloud. So one of the out of box function is called auto walk for the sports to have this autonomous mission. So basically is what we use is use what we call is visual teach and repeat technique. So the operator can drive uh, the robots and then once finished, they're going to recall all the data and the robot can repeat. So that's trajectory. So it's also using the fiducial to set waypoints for inspection points or using that to correct the odometry drift. So we're going to run a live demo later. So the sport also have uh, SDK to support all the development and also there's a ROS driver and we also using that to support our applications. Uh, so we took the robots to one of the construction sites uh, last week and did some trials. And since we had a LiDAR, so we also using the LiDAR to build a 3D map of the construction site. You can see this is a video and this is the sport robot. Sorry, it's a bit small because the size is a bit big. And on the bottom right is the color, this is the image coming from the onboard uh, camera. So when the robot is starting to move around, so you can see the point cloud starting to building this 3D map of the construction site. And you can see all these uh, pillars, all these frames and the which is starting. So we think this is a very interesting and promising help to help us to understand the construction process and also the dimensional checking and which we can use in then to optimize the construction process and reduce the amount of rework. But meanwhile, and there's also more and more applications and user cases as Gabriel mentioned already. So especially looking at how to use the sport robots for the hazardous detections to reduce the number of accidents so this is re we're really keen to bring the robot to the different sectors, but construction is the one we are looking at. So while the robots move around, you can see this small here, and we're scanning all these construction frames and autonomously using the robots, and uh, you can see all the point clouds reconstructed. And uh, so once we roughly finish, we can in instantly get in a very nice 3D map of the environment. So which looks like, uh, oh, sorry. So which looks like this, okay? So, and, uh, and if we zoom in, we can see more of the details and very nicely of the structure. Then we can use that to measure the dimensions and help understand the process. Also, we have a 360 camera. So the 360 camera gives us more of this inspection data to even look at that from a browser very easily to inspect what's happening around the robot when we collect the data. So we're going to use this data to deploy with machine learning algorithms to better understand the environment and to help understand all the data and the inspection. So we also show the one with the very, very interesting software and the very useful use case. Great. So now without further ado, so I think it's an exciting time. So I will pass to Josh Rhee, uh, our research engineer at Orca Hub for the live demo of the sport. Thank you, Sen. Hello, I'm Joshua Rowe. I'm a research engineer here at Orca Hub um, and Ocean Systems Lab. So today we're going to show a live demo of Spot traversing some of the terrain around the Robotarium West uh, and a little part outside of the Robotarium where we'll show collision avoidance. Okay. Yep. 
So the robot is using the teach and repeat auto walk. We've taught it this path and it will now traverse the same path again. So we have fiducial localization markers around the site that the robot will use to localize itself to ensure that it, it, its map and plan of movement is lined up with the world itself. The, the spot robot's very capable of going up standard staircases. Um, it will go forwards up, but in order to come back down the stairs, it will reverse down. So it will relocalize against the marker again before heading outside. So on board the robot, we have five RGBD um, depth sensing cameras that are used for, for our collision avoiding of the environment. So when an obstacle is detected, the robot will avoid that and traverse around it. While still being able to maintain going through tight gaps in items like fences and doorways. So the robot will once again relocalize against the marker and you would have these uh, semi-permanently installed around your site. And the robot will now return back to where we started the demo. Thanks very much for watching this. And I'm gonna hand back to Maurice. Okay, Joshua, um, excellent demo. Thank, thank you very much for sharing all that. That's, um, that's quite impressive to see, in fact. Um, and all from a few clicks on a, on a, on a keyboard on a, or on a, on a game controller. Uh, okay, um, I'll take over and I'll, we'll switch over to the, the Animal. Um, and I should remember to share my screen. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm Morris Fallon. So I'm uh, the research group lead in, in our legged robotics group, which we call Dynamic Robot Systems here in Oxford. And we work on uh, all aspects of legged, ro legged robots. And here you can see a picture of the animal robot working uh, to explore an underground mine. Uh, so we've been going for about three or four years um, and uh, we focused on multiple uh, legged platforms, uh, both copies of the Animal Robots, which is made by a company in Switzerland called Anibotics. And uh, we focus on uh, different aspects. So perception on, mostly on my side and mapping and control mostly on Yanis Avutis, who's here in this picture on the right hand side. And today, um, Oliver and Russell um, and Milad will demonstrate the Animal Robot as well as our mapping system. I'll just overview a little bit of the research that we do uh, on, uh, on the legged platforms. The first aspect is motion planning and control, which is obviously a huge part of uh, quadruped systems. So if um, we tend to think about this as how to plan the motions of the robot subject to some constraints about where you want it to go from point A to point B, the dynamics of the system. So that's the, uh, the inertia and the rotational uh, momentum of the, of the robot, for example. Um, limitations on the robot's um, capacity to generate forces or to move its legs uh, and, and it needs to interact with the world by making contact so it makes contact by pressing with its feet 
within friction cones that are illustrated there. So Oliver, who's going to give the demo in a minute, will uh, demonstrate some of the research on planning, converting all of these constraints into um, motions that you can see here on the right hand side to generate complex motions that can allow the robot to plan uh, positions of its feet and, the, and its body to be able to move over uneven terrain. Now, this video doesn't show the uh, the representation that the robot's using, but typically both Animal and Spot are using uh, downward facing depth cameras to map the ground and Oliver will demonstrate that in a minute. Uh, a lot of the work that my, uh, that my students uh, work on is, is navigation and mapping. Um, and uh, in these kind of challenging industrial uh, situations, such as this um, mine on the left hand side that was part of the DARPA subterranean challenge that we're, working, we're involved in, which is a multi year competition for developing the capacity of robots like this to explore underground facilities, um, you can see uh, some, of the, some of the common challenges. So firstly, the robot needs to carry its own lighting because it's entirely dark. Um, the ground that you can see underneath the robot's feet is muddy. It's got puddles, um, which, which actually has big impacts on, on the robot's capacity to perceive the ground. Um, the, the, the depth cameras that we have typically can't see when there are puddles, for example. So you need to be able to use some learning to, or some, some, uh, some algorithm to, to fill in, the, in that. Um, so within this competition, we've been focusing in our contribution of, to the team called Cerberus, uh, um, in, uh, which is made up of partners from the University of Nevada, Reno, um, ETH Zurich and N NTNU Norway, and Berkeley. Um, on, we've been focusing on, on navigation. So combining together all of the different sensors on the robot. So whether that's um, the green uh, depth camera, uh, the uh, motor sensors from the robot's joints, um, laser, very same model as the one that was on the animal or on the spot that you just saw in the demo, as well as multi -ca multiple cameras pointing in all directions because the, the purpose of the challenge is to visually explore and to detect objects of interest. So we've been combining together all of those sensor sources to build up navigation capability. And we also actually distill that down into a handheld device that just combines a computer, a camera system and a lighter. And, and Milad will demonstrate that in a few minutes. And here's what it looks like in some of the realistic industrial environments. So all, all of the lighting that, that the robot needs to be able to navigate in this environment is, is on board. And you can see the visual cameras being used to track these yellow features these green planes are being extracted from the LiDAR and we're using that to build up this very accurate estimate of the motion of the robot, this blue line being overlaid on the ground truth. Um, and then having got this very accurate motion estimate, then you can use that to build large scale maps. Um, so uh, uh, that was something that Sen mentioned, but here illustrating it going to very large scales where you see these green flashes, which correspond to recognizing that you've been in that place before. And that allows you to deform or to twist the map so as to keep it consistent so that you can uh, create something that's going to be architecturally consistent, allowing you to do things like um, bring it into a CAD program and to measure deviations from the intended uh, intended uh, reconstruction. So this is about 400 meters by 400 meters being scanned. Um, this is by the handheld system, but the same kind of capability is, is possible with the legged robots. Um, and then you can start building that into applications. So this is a, a deployment we did as part of the ORCA project, um, an earlier version of the animal, and its job was to navigate between all of these markers that you see illustrated in this point cloud map. Instead of the teach and repeat uh, approach that Sen illustrated, our approach is, is LiDAR based. So here we're using a full scale map of the facility and using that to, um, to position ourselves within. And effectively the robot is, is going from point to point and using its onboard sensors to cap measurement, capture imagery. So for example, here it's stopping to use its camera to capture an, a piece of a photograph of a, um, a piece of plant equipment um, and, and moving on in the same kind of guise. So here, here uh, you can see it's stopping and it's uh, using its camera to capture a dial reading and so on. So this, this is having built these maps laying out a mission either in teach and repeat mode as Sen was talking about or uh, simply a series of autonomous waypoints um, and then the robot can autonomously navigate to them from start to finish and return home at the end. Um, uh, then in, in more unexplored environments we've been working with Createc to do 
um, exploration based, based mapping. So this is without any prior information of the, uh, the robot is autonomously uh, building up this local representation that you can see on the right hand side, laying out these markers that you can see in yellow and then using those to expand its map um, as, it, as it goes, as it goes to explore free space. And uh, this was as part of an Innovate UK project that has just finished in which when we uh, adapted that with a radiation sensor, the one that you can see at the top of this, this is a gamma radiation sensor developed by Createc and commercially available. We can colorize the reconstruction, as you can see on the left-hand side, um, with a hotspot, which was a, um, uh, an intentionally located um, gamma radiation source. So uh, in doing so, we were able to deploy the robot autonomously. It can go out into the unknown environment, um, map, map uh, hazard, hazards like this and return home. I'll finish up by just showing some initial work with deploying the spot robot. Uh, we're just working to adapt that mapping technology to the platform. And you can see here, it's been taken across four, uh, three floors of, of, our, of our lab here. Um, and you can see these green flashes, which correspond to recognizing it's been in the same location before. And you can see the detail and the accuracy of the reconstruction that comes from um, um, mapping with, with these kind of uh, dynamically moving platforms. Okay, so we'll finish up at this stage and uh, I'm going to flip it over to um, my students here who are downstairs um, uh, and postdocs uh, in particular. Milad, would you want to take control? Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you very much, Maurice. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Milad Ramazzoni, a postdoc at Oxford Robotics Institute. Uh, today, um, I'd like to introduce our mobile LiDAR mapping system. Um, so now you should be able uh, to see basically our uh, LiDAR uh, uh, mapping system. So as you see the screen, uh, on the screen, the hardware configuration is what uh, Sen and uh, Morris covered. From a software perspective, uh, we basically integrate all the available information coming from the LiDAR, IMU, and the camera. Camera and IMU provides motion prior for the LiDAR point cloud registration. Now um, I'm sharing my screen and you'd be able to see the system output. Meanwhile, uh, a colleague of mine, Russell, is carrying the device um, around the lab. So can you see my screen now? Not yet. Uh, so I started sharing my screen. So well, I can I see the can, screen. We can see Zoom. We can't see your Arvis. So uh, uh, yep. Okay. All right. Yes. There we go. So uh, yes. Uh, uh, basically, uh, here you see every time we have two point clouds: the one in purple and the other one in blue. The purple one, which is the live cloud, is registered with the blue that we call it reference cloud, and it is an accumulation of a history of uh, point clouds. Also, you see the poses of the sensors visualized for every two meters travel distance. This uh, mobile mapping system can be very useful, as Morris mentioned, to map uh, an industrial environment very quickly to provide uh, a prior map for further tasks, such as inspection of assets. So now um, uh, I hand it to my colleague, uh, Olivia, to demonstrate uh, our animal uh, sea robot. So thank you for your attention. Welcome to the Oxford Robotics Institute. My name is Oliver Mellon, and today I will be talking to you about some of the most exciting advancements in legged locomotion. Today with me, we have the animal sea quadruped from a private company called Anibotics. Similarly to Spot, Animal C uses RGBD cameras for mapping of the terrain. It has a camera. Sorry, I mean, this was a, an emergency uh, stop mistakenly pressed. So we'll restart the robot and get back to you as soon as possible. Okay, um, I think we'll um, we'll leave our animal demo there, and we'll uh, we'll uh, uh, maybe break for questions. And if Oliver's been able to set it up in a few minutes' time, we can uh, jump back. Um, uh, 
So, um, and we're interested to, to hear from those who are, who are listening uh, about other application spaces where they're interested in using uh, quadruped robots or um, where they see uh, the opportunity for uh, applications going forward. Um, um, but uh, feel, fr feel free to interrupt or to use the, the chat facility to, to ask questions. Um, I, there was one earlier, um, it was a question for, for Gabriel about uh, what kind of opportunities or how it would be possible to, um, to, uh, to interact with Costain to, uh, to demonstrate technology or to, uh, to, uh, to access uh, test facilities perhaps. Yes, so we're very open to collaboration. Um, I've responded to that question and put my email in there, so please feel free. Uh, to drop me an email and we can discuss further but um, so the sustained model is to collaborate with um, research institutions um, smes or e even sort of similar tier one contractors and our clients to deliver industry shaping technologies so very happy to collaborate very happy to map out opportunities we can what, provide what, Go on. what kind of um uh safety uh for the site that you we used before when we worked with we it was quite a curated site i think it was a controlled site um and it was a, it was a kind of a, a test deployment what would you envisage would be the typical operation mode of the robot given how many uh um high mass um how, how, how many uh, different plant equipment are moving around how can you envisage it being used would it be used early in the morning would it be used after after normal site operations have finished yeah i think it could be a bit of both so after site operations finished there's a lot of plant equipment um, high value plant equipment left on site um, so in terms of security being able to monitor the site for any intruders um, that'd be a good one in, in terms of start or shifts there's a lot of survey works that go on um, during the day and if the spot robot can carry out those surveys um, before so the shift starts, that is saving time and also saving costs means people can get on with the work. So once the day starts, so really it's taking away um, sort of uh, monotonous tasks that normally humans will carry out. And um, again, those sa time savings and cost benefits um, are massive. Um, I think also in terms of the vision, we want a situation where we've got cobots and the ability for the robot to again interface with moving plant and humans mm -hmm. on the construction side. So that is the vision. And we know there's a huge um, opportunity there around utilizing technologies such as artificial intelligence and video analytics and so on to help support that vision. So we definitely want to work towards that as well. Yeah, I think that the, the challenge of moving from a static uh, industrial facility where uh, the robot can be uh, deployed autonomously to do a very predictable mission to, do, to a very fluid environment where there is a lot going on uh, is, is a significant challenge. Um, I think only in the last couple of years have you, uh, do you see these robots um, having omnidirectional sensing so that they can actually see in all directions, never mind uh, yeah. track objects and avoid obstacles, and then never mind intelligently uh, make decisions. So really kind of the, the, the capabilities of the spot in particular uh, is really Kind of opens doors to new avenues of 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 expo or of deployment where um ro roboticists might be famous for deploying box-shaped robots going around office blocks and really throwing them out into fluid and moving environments is a challenge okay send did you want to run through some of the some of the questions that have been asked yes so uh there's one of the questions asking any use case about the retail industry so especially, for example, cleaning the aisles, so for the liquid spills and uh, close to the shelves. So Morris, well, do you guess, want to answer that? I, I guess we don't really have um, a person on to talk about retail. I have talked uh, informally. We, we, we meet people a lot less these days, but informally, I've, in, about a year ago, I remember speaking with um, um, uh, with a major supermarket chain where they were interested in the last mile delivery. So that, that would be, um, I think in the order of uh, 10 to 20% of the cost of, the, of, uh, of, um, of our food is in the logistics of getting it to the door. 
um, and being able to reduce that by autonomously deploying either the actual on-road vehicles or the actual last uh, 20 meters. So there have been some demonstrations of that. I'm not so sure about spills and, and, and cleaning. Um, it doesn't necessarily fit within what I would envisage as being the, 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 the expected use case. Maurice, may I just jump in there and say, have you seen the, there's a, there's a company that um, have, a, have a vehicle that traverses around um, um, airports to deploy uh, UVC lighting to aid with um, uh, disinfecting from, from a COVID perspective? Mm -hmm. Potential use case there for, for, for robots in large retail environments from that point of view, potentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, I get, I get the characteristic for, for legged platforms are where there are terrain obstacles, um, um, but where you have a multi floor uh, department store, that, that could be a use case. In particular, on the stairwells um, yes. is the unique, unique capability where you re remove the person from doing chemical spray. That would be a typical characteristic. Um, are, there, are there other questions, Sam? So there's also a question about security protocols and uh, use against cyber attacks. I think that's a very general problem for not only for lag robotics, I think for many of these robots. So I think our view for now actually, so our robot is not directly connected with the inter open internet. And at least for everything we connect, unless mostly we are only using VPN as a firewall mm -hmm. to have our robots kind of out, out of this open internet as a kind of protection. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's the one. Yeah, so I think I think it would be wrong for us to sort of present that we're experts in cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, yes. uh, it, 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 it is, th these robots are merely other computers that are in a network and the, 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 the typical procedures of cybersecurity would, would, would all have to be presented. I'm, I'm Irish and at the moment, the Irish government are reconstructing the healthcare systems IT um, because of, of the, the cyber attack that hit the same cyber attack that hit the US. So it's it's for physically moving equipment. Obviously, this is going to be a, would be a serious issue. Um, so we're 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 close to running over. But um, um, Ollie has said that we're back with the animal. So if uh, Oliver wants to take prime, we'll 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 do the demo and then finish up with um, the last questions. Uh, don't hit the e stop button before the demo. Okay. Uh, Oliver, do you want to take it, take it from here? Welcome again. I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but we expect that this was a human error. If anything, it has demonstrated that these platforms can be safely and slowly lowered to the ground when needed. As I was mentioning, the robot uses RGB cameras to map the terrain. And on top of it, we can also see that it has a LiDAR sensor, which is used to scan and map the environment using the 16 beams that it produces that are continuously rotating. This robot uses electric actuators. It has two in its hip and one in its knee. All of these actuators are capable of producing 55 Newton meters of torque and they're fully waterproof. So the robot can operate on oil rigs in all weather conditions, and it can even enter a lake without stopping. This robot is capable of walking up at speeds of over one meter per second, which we will demonstrate right now. The robot is pre-planning this motion at a frequency of 400 hertz. And I will demonstrate how this reactive behavior occurs. As you can see, the robot has been very reactive, replanning where to put its footholds to support its center of pressure. The robot will now move towards the preferred pallet behind me where it will try to climb it, and I will explain how the robot is modeling this environment. The robot is currently being positioned right in front of the pallet, and my colleague will share the screen so that you can see how this environment is built in our digital ecosystem. The robot is leveraging the sensors on board and produces um, 
the map of, of the lab, as you can see right now. And here we can see what we call the elevation map, which is the reconstructed model of the terrain in front of it. So you can see a very sharp edge uh, of the palette. And now the robot will um, Now the robot will be walking towards the pallet and planning its foothold so that it can safely traverse on top of the pallet. So you can see as the robot approaches the obstacle, the elevation map is growing. In fact, the elevation map is about six by six meters Once the robot reaches the top, we will ask it to step down. And this is possible because during this operation, it has acquired the model of the environment. So it remembers what is behind it. In this lab, we do a similar kind of research specifically on algorithms for motion planning and motion execution. We tend to leverage memory to do very dynamic motions as well as reinforcement learning and AI. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Oliver. I've, I've, I've never seen a robot demo in which you, it crashes to the ground and it gets back up and it finishes the demo without, uh, without requiring an expensive repair. So, uh, but it's in, indicative of the fact that these, are, these robots do fall over, but they don't necessarily break, which is, I think is, that is the testament to the, to the manufacturers and the improvements of the technology. Um, um, so let's, uh, let's finish with that and we'll, we'll, we'll cover any remaining questions. Those are, uh, we're running slightly over, but I think we've actually pulled off the webinar on time. Um, Sen, are there any more questions? I think there's a very good last question for us is, uh, what's the feedback from end users? I think this is a question for Will, and also Gabriel, because this you are you guys all presented already, and also is user of this. So I'll I'll start off by saying that um, that, that my end users um, spoken to quite recently in, in in nuclear are absolutely giving back um, positive feedback. You know we are we are at early stages, um, but we can see that with careful forethought and planning that, that there really is a credible uh, solution here um, with strong economic benefits. Of, of deploying legged robots in, in nuclear and, and oil and gas. Like I say, we're at the early stages, um, but it's, it's looking positive now. Mm. You know, I, I, th I think that, um, for example, Boston Dynamics are valued at about a, a billion when they were acquired by Hyundai. And um, it's indicative, like that, that kind of valuation is very significant compared to any other mobile robot application that's available. So uh, I feel, and I've anticipated maybe for a number of years, is, is that when, when they pass a degree of reliability and robustness that the flexibility and, of, and the mobility can enable uh, applications that would otherwise have been deemed to be uh, uh, um, uh, uh, unsuitable for, for these platforms, even, even if it's just walking on, on flat ground where there's one terrain obstacle, a pipe or a, a door jam, um, oftentimes, wheel robots can have to be uh, modified specifically for a, for a deployment. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. What I mentioned in the in, in the presentation is that I do I do see legged vehicles becoming a a sort of a whole site asset um, as opposed to wheel robots that there's potentially for one specific purpose or, or, or function. That's significant benefit. Okay. Sen, have we any more questions or will we finish at this stage? Uh, I think there's, there's maybe one more question about how do you learn to become a, ro a complete robotic engineer? Well, I would say that robotics is a multifaceted domain in that uh, we have integration experts like, like Will, we have navigation people like, like Sen and I, Oliver talked about um, motion planning and control. It's, it's a com combination of, of capabilities. And I think only when the, leg the, the locomotion con co components are just working, do, can it really be integrated within a within a complicated deployment? So it's it's about the, the kind of the, those puzzles being pieces being put together. Um, Sen, have you anything else to add? No, uh, no, I think I think this is brilliant. So uh, I think I would thank everyone and also thank our uh, 
and Yuati Talks from Will and also Gabriel. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Um, and thanks to the Orca Hub for uh, and Anna in particular for for coordinating and setting things up. Thank you, Anna, uh, Anna Will, and Gabriel. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.